my name is Scott Hiley. Uh, I've been a member of the uh, CPUSA since uh, 2010, I think. Um, I uh, currently do some work for the website, uh, so I may have answered some of your questions uh, via email or, or on Facebook. Um, uh, right now, um, um, a lot of my political work is centered on the, uh, the upcoming midterms and trying to flip my uh, deep red district in upstate New York into a blue one. Uh, so that's, uh, that's who I am. That's where I'm coming from. Um, two tactics uh, is one of my favorite texts. I find it sort of endlessly challenging, endlessly interesting. And I think it has a lot of, uh, well, it's interesting because it's one of the ones that's, it feels sometimes hard to adapt to our own time, but at the same time, I think it has a lot of really, really important lessons uh, for our political moment. So that's, um, uh, yeah, that's that. Um, I'm going to start sort of delve in kind of uh, slowly, give people a chance to, you know, log on and everything. Um, the way this will work is uh, I'm going to kind of present the background of what was going on in Russia when Lenin wrote this, um, draw out the kind of main argument that he makes, and then, uh, or the, and in fact, the, the two tactics that he's comparing and opposing to one another, and then uh, draw out from that some of the main lessons that I think we can draw uh, from Lenin's text. Um, there should be um, some ample time for discussion, uh, and so I hope you brought your questions and comments and, and, and thoughts. Um, uh, that's designed for everybody. You don't have to be a Marxist. You don't have to know Lenin. You don't have to you know, be able to quote um, chapter and page number uh, of two tactics. I know I certainly can't. Uh, uh, it's uh, so hopefully it'll it'll have something for everybody. Uh, so um, before I really get going with the the meat of two tactics, I wanted to give some general terms and concepts and kind of a background. Uh, for uh, you know why we use this text as as socialists as um, working class revolutionaries as people interested in, in transforming society so we and I say we Marxists we communists uh, see society as divided into two main classes the working class includes everyone whose living comes from wages the people who do the work who produce things and when I say working class, it's not just blue collar white guys. The, the image you get in a lot of representations of the working class is that it's you know just, I mean, certainly um, white blue collar workers are part of the working class, um, but um, the working class is multiracial, it is multinational, it includes women and men, um, it includes, uh, you know, teachers and doctors and engineers and factory workers and fast food workers and unemployed people and retirees it's it's a much bigger uh group than than a lot of people think of so that's one class the other class is the capitalist class and that's basically the lucky few who get their income from profits so uh most of the value that we produce actually goes to um, share, big shareholders, corporate executives, those are the capitalists. Um, we see those classes as uh, in conflict with one another. Um, the general idea of Marxism is that when we get to a certain point, capitalism holds our society back more than it moves it forward. Um, and the working class has the leading role in overthrowing capitalism, capitalism and moving society forward, furthering development. Um, uh, as far as Lenin goes, um, 
one of Lenin's main contributions to this, this Marxist science, this Marxist uh, theory, way of understanding and changing the world, um, was this idea that social change comes in stages. So we can separate the democratic revolution from the socialist revolution. In the democratic revolution, you start from a society where civil and political rights are unequal based on birth. Um, could be feudalism where you have serfs and, and uh, aristocrats, it could be um, slavery, it could be Jim Crow, it could be uh, any number of unequal distributions of rights. Um, the democratic revolution takes a society like that and transforms it into a society where, in theory, all people have equal civil and political rights. Um, so this democratic revolution um, could um, uh, includes the great bourgeois revolutions like the French Revolution. Uh, it includes that the Haitian Revolution, obviously. It also includes our civil war and reconstruction, um, uh, the civil rights movement, the fight for uh, women's suffrage. All of those are parts of this democratic revolution. The important thing to realize is that full equality is not possible under capitalism. Capitalism requires that people who own property have power over people who own only their labor power. Capitalists have to be in control over workers. And um, to get rid of that inequality, you need a socialist revolution. So we see the socialist revolution as extending and actually completing the democratic revolution. These stages are not, you know, airtight, solid historical things where we say, okay, the democratic revolution ends here and the socialism, the socialist revolution begins the next day. It's a general guideline for understanding this process of change. And the working class is the only force that can fight for democracy all the way to the end. Even the most democratically minded capitalist still needs to control workers. So only the working class, the, the role of the working class is to push the fight for democracy as far as it can go. Um, and if you have a question at any point in this, um, you can click your raised hand uh, button and Dee will, uh, will call on you. Um, and D, certainly feel free to, um, you know, uh, jump in and notify me that, that people have questions. And I'll pause periodically as well to ask for them. Okay, moving on. So, uh, background. Where was Russia in 1905? Two, that's the year Two Tactics was written. Um, Russia in 1905 was a lot like our society in some ways. So, it was the, the, the head of it, the ruler, was a tyrant masquerading as a man of the people and supported by conservative religious figures. The Orthodox Church in Russia, uh, conservative evangelical Christians here. Uh, the domestic policy was very much based on the persecution of national minorities, the promotion of, in that case, uh, ethnic Russians as being superior to other nationalities. Here, obviously, the, um, uh, the approach to um, immigration uh, is is our example. You had ultra conservative groups preaching and using violence against political opponents. Uh, you had a legacy of a system of bondage that still structured society in a lot of ways. So here we have the legacy of slavery and settler colonialism that we're still dealing with. In Russia, it was the legacy of serfdom, which had only been abolished in 1861. Most importantly, there was a broad democratic insurgency against the regime. There, like everybody, was upset with the czar. Not everybody, uh, but farmers, national minorities, democratic intellectuals, small business owners, small farmers, workers, farm laborers. Like there's this huge, broad um, uprising. How is it unlike our society? First of all, capitalism was only in its early stages there. Um, most people were still farmers or farm workers. Um, and agriculture had not been fully reshaped by capitalism yet. It had a czar who was not elected. It had a hereditary aristocracy. It had almost no democratic institutions. Um, it had sort of a kind of 
parliament and local councils, but they were really dominated, structurally dominated by the aristocracy and the clergy. Um, and for workers, um, for farm laborers, for peasants, um, you didn't really vote. Uh, strikes, rallies, and armed insurrection were the main political tools for a lot of the members of society. Significant difference. So, um, Democratic revolution is breaking out in 1905. Um, and it is a bourgeois revolution. I love this painting. Uh, this is the, um, a scene of the sort of victory parade in October 1905 uh, after the establishment of a constitutional monarchy. Um, and you can see this is not a parade of workers or peasants. It's, it, it is uh, wealthier people, obviously. So this democratic revolution is so bourgeois. It is a bourgeois revolution. That's what Lenin calls it. What does that mean? Calling it a bourgeois revolution means that it's not going to go beyond capitalism. It's not going to reshape the basic property relations in society. In fact, it's going to strengthen the capitalist class. It's going to develop capitalism further in Russia. So that's what he's saying. He's not saying that this democratic revolution, this insurgency to make society more equal, it, it's not only going to help the capitalist class. In fact, he says, this is going to be most advantageous to the working class. It's going to empower them, to give them more freedom to organize. And he's also not saying that every democratic revolution, every stage of democratic revolution, always and everywhere will strengthen the capitalist class. He's saying that right now in Russia, this democratic revolution is going to strengthen capitalism. And that's okay because it's all a much better position to play our cards right. So how should the working class respond to this democratic revolution? Um, actually, are there any questions so far? Have any? Uh... No. Okay. Um, this text is called. Oh, sorry. To scroll. Wait. Yeah, there is one. You sure? Yeah. Let's have it. Vaughn, your mic is open on our end. Please open it on your end. Okay, uh, Scott, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, uh, Scott, I was going to say that I was amazed when I read 1905 by uh, Leon Trotsky that it was, as you said, the revolution in 1905 was uh, the goals were basically bourgeois, uh, freedom of the press, uh, an elected uh, Duma, constituent assembly, if you will, uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech. However, they also fought, these are two things that I think are important. First of all, it was led by workers. Uh, the typesetters uh, went on strike, followed by the railway workers, and they formed Soviets. And it was actually led by what I will consider to be the proletariat. Secondly, they fought for something what we would probably consider to be very, very mild in terms of their demands at the time, and that was an eight-hour day. Otherwise, they worked from seven o'clock. They reported to work at 645 and didn't get off till dark. So an eight-hour day was one of their demands, a very mild, very modest demand, but nevertheless, that was the beginning of workers, the proletariat, actually standing up for something specifically that they would benefit by. Otherwise, it was strictly bourgeois. Everything from freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech. And under that, guys, they were able to print uh, their uh, socialist papers, newspapers at night in secret by seizing the printing presses of bourgeois newspapers. I just thought you might 
find that interesting. And I highly recommend the book 1905 by Trotsky. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. There is another hand. Um, okay. Margaret, your, your mic is open. Margaret, your mic is open, your hand. We don't hear you if you're speaking. Okay. You can go on. Okay. Um, so just to uh, respond to, uh, to Vaughn's comment, um, yeah, so and I think you know there are a couple of things we can we can draw from this idea of the the important uh, of the the what you call the, the bourgeois demands of this revolution. Um, in a certain sense, they we should you know take that as an argument for the importance of these things. I think we we sometimes have a ten or there is sometimes a tendency on the left to underestimate the importance of things like um, uh, freedom of assembly and you know, the ability to uh, print and circulate newspapers without constant uh, censorship and having the government shut down your presses. Like these are real things that the working class was fighting for. In terms of the goals, what's gonna come out of Lenin's text is that different sections of different class forces had different goals for this revolution. And um, some sets were more uh, ambitious than others. So we'll see kind of, uh, kind of where that goes. But thanks very much for, for the recommendation. Um, so uh, this, cl this class, this text is called uh, Two Tactics. Um, we're going to compare these two tactics. Tactic one starts off by saying, we should maintain, we the working class, we a party of the working class should maintain our political independence by warning workers about the treachery of bourgeois Democrats and refusing to take part in any provisional government. If we are successful, we will be ready to wield power when it falls into our hands. And that last one is an actual quote from a uh, uh, newspaper article published by um, some of the people engaged in this tactic or promoting this tactic. So that's tactic one. Tactic two says, we should orient this revolution in the most democratic direction possible by fighting for a provisional government under the control of workers and peasants. If we're successful, we can decisively defeat the czarist autocracy and defend whatever gains we've made against the bourgeoisie who are gonna come and try to take away whatever we get for ourselves. So these are the two tactics. Um, there are no wrong answers. Actually, yes, there is very much a wrong answer for Lenin, for Lenin anyway. Um, Lenin said, tactic one is basically saying, um, we're, we're washing our hands of it. Let the bourgeoisie have their bourgeois revolution. We'll stand by and agitate for socialism. And then um, when all of these provisional governments are toppled over, we'll take power it'll fall into our hands, right? But we, we must not allow the workers to be confused about where we stand. We must not be dissolved into bourgeois democracy. And Lenin says that is extremely dangerous. Um, so the tactic Lenin prefers, get in there, um, organize, mobilize, fight for control, political leadership of this revolution, that way we can secure the, the most gains possible for our class and in fact for the people, including the uh, revolutionary segments of the, the, peasant, the peasantry, the petty bourgeoisie. So why are we talking about two tactics right now before the midterms? Um, I'm sure many of us have heard these arguments before. The Democrats betray us. We have to warn people. They're not trustworthy. They're not reliable. Voting just legitimizes the system. The system is broken. Don't, don't participate in it. The two parties are the same. We should be agitating for socialism, not wasting our time on bourgeois politics. The resistance 
don't worry about the resistance, that's just a bunch of liberals pretending to be revolutionary. These arguments are exactly what Lenin was arguing against. They're, they sound radical, but what they come down to is telling the working class to get out of the main political struggle of the day and effectively give power to other forces. Um, so this is why two tactics matters right now. Um, uh, it's the question of whether the working class should be in this main political struggle, uh, striving to take leadership of it, directed in the most democratic way possible, or washing its hands and um, sitting on the sidelines. There are four basic ideas that I want to bring out of, uh, of Lenin's text. Um, actually, uh, that's an, this is another good spot to... Actually, no, I'm going to go through the four basic ideas and then we'll... Um, or some of them, and then we'll have questions again. Basic idea number one, we can't sit out the fight for democracy right now. And that, that is the fight against Trump and the Republican Party. Um, if we don't break the power of the extreme right, there is no question of getting to socialism or even of advancing our democratic struggle beyond where it is now, because our democratic revolution is not, you know, we're not all the way there. Um, breaking the power of the right is the precondition for any positive change. Um, so, and this is this is my interpretation, my my application of Lenin's ideas that the the working class must be in this main political struggle. Um, there's a, a a long block quote from Lenin below, um, where he says basically, yeah. Um, working, striking jointly with the bourgeoisie, um, you know, treating them as a, like an inconsistent ally, uh, being in this democratic movement with them, that is temporary. But just because it's temporary doesn't mean we can, we can't get to socialism without it. Um, and ignoring it is, he says, to ignore or neglect this task in any way would be tantamount to betraying socialism and rendering a service to reaction. So even though it's not the fight for socialism, it's still the fight that we need to get to the fight for socialism. Basic idea two, we need a decisive defeat of reactionary forces. In Lenin's time, the reactionary forces was, it was the czar, the czarist autocracy, um, the, uh, uh, conservative forces that supported it. A decisive defeat doesn't mean that we negotiate a new deal with reactionary forces. It doesn't mean we uh, share power with them or come to new terms. It means that we break their power. I and mean, Lenin is very, very clear on this. Um, for Lenin, decisive defeat of reactionary forces meant abolition of the monarchy, formation of a republic based on universal suffrage, along with the, the bourgeois rights that, that Vaughn mentioned, rooting out every vestige of serfdom, including the uh, working conditions uh, for workers that were still very much influenced by um, serfdom, and most importantly, shutting down any attempt to restore the czar. Um, so it's a, a decisive defeat of reaction is a very, 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 very ambitious goal. In US history, what, what have we meant by, um, or what, has been, what have been decisive defeats of reaction? We might think of the military occupation of the South after the defeat of the Confederacy in the Civil War, radical reconstruction, forced integration of schools, uh, universal suffrage, federal oversight of voting practices. So these are very, very big changes. Uh, the intent of, of which at least is to prevent us from sliding back into the old undemocratic order. Um, and now I wanna ask a question. So I think where we can get some, some discussion in here. What would a decisive defeat of reactionary forces look like today? What might it include? Um, 
And keep in mind what Lenin said about this in 1905. He said basically, in, in two tactics, I'm not really optimistic that we're gonna get there. But if you're gonna struggle, know what winning is and struggle for that. Um, it sounds kind of like a code, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but anyway. So, um, your ideas. What would a decisive defeat of reactionary forces look like today? Jeff, your mic is open. And I've also got a, I've also got a few written questions um, as well. So. Uh, there's something wrong with your audio, Jeff uh, Elkner. Try again, please. Jeff Elkner, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Um, also, I want to uh, let people know if you would like to uh, write a question, I'm sort of keeping an eye on those as well. I may not be able to get to all of them, um, and I, I do apologize. I, I'll do my best to uh, look through them and, and try to uh, address them as we're, uh, as we're going on. Um, so you can write a question using the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. Diane, your mic is open. Hi, Dee. Um, what I was thinking of, like, just maybe this doesn't sound like a great big thing, but to me, it would be really important. If our representatives, both in the Senate and the House of Representatives in the state and the U.S. government, if they look like the rest of this country, as many women, as many minorities, I think that would be, go a long way to bringing equality to this country. Thank you. If you'd like to make a comment or raise a question, please use your raised hand icon. Uh, ben, your mic is open. Can you hear me? A little louder, please. Can you hear me, Dean? A little louder, please. I'm, I'm, how's that? It's like you're very far away, but can you hear him, Scott? Yes, I can. I can hear him. Okay. My, I'm wondering, maybe I'm going to answer the question with a question, but would a decisive, would, for example, the winning of truly democratic elections, one person, one vote, and uh, increased access to the ballot for everybody instead of having the right to vote taken away, as we are seeing in state after state now. And it, it leads me to wonder about other things. For example, I read in one account that uh, Kamala Harris, a senator from California, that, that her constituents have something like 1 60th the, the amount of of clout that uh, the the constituents of some of the people of some of the senators from smaller states, um, including Vermont and including Rhode Island and including others, but some of the states where the Republican senators came from have much smaller populations. So it leads me to wonder: Does it does the Senate? The upper house, which was put in place as a result of a compromise 200 and how many 50 years ago, would the transformation of the Senate into a more democratic body, would that be a defeat for reaction? And similarly, would the uh, abolition of the Electoral College be a defeat for reaction? And I'm wondering how we, how we raise those demands. Just a, just a thought. All right, thank you very much. Uh, other, other ideas, what other, what other things, what other demands, what other victories might be part of a decisive defeat of reaction? Um, shutting down the possibility of backsliding, breaking the power of the light. Beth, your mic is open. Okay. Hi, Scott. Um, 
good lead off. I really um, am enjoying this uh, discussion. I think it's really uh, exhilarating. Um, I think a decisive or a defeat for a uh, reaction um, in this election would be the Democrats taking hold of the House of Representatives. Um, the leadership would change. The um, balance of power in the uh, Congress would change and it would lay open the possibilities for other changes. Everything else I think is um, toward more towards the decisive el element that you um, uh, talked about. Uh, should uh, the Democrats improve their uh, position in the uh, Senate, that would be very important. Should the um, proportion of right-wing control of the state legislatures uh, tip uh, from down from 32 to 28 or 20, whatever, whatever the number is, all those I think could be considered important um, tools, uh, important developments uh, in the uh, in the resistance fight. That's it. All right. Thank you. Any other any other thoughts? Uh, All right. Corey, right. Corey, your mic is open. Um, for me, one of the big things for a def decisive defeat would be um, seeing like local control of policing or community control of policing. I think that's probably one of the big places that we're going to need a victory in order to not backslide. Thanks. Anyone else? Just a moment. Henry, your mic is open. Henry, your mic is open. <laughs> this is the second person where the audio is not, uh, for some reason, the audio is, is not working. Sorry, Henry. And Henry, if you want to, if you want to um, type your answer as a, in, in the question box or type your, yeah, type your comment in the question box, I can, I can read it out for you. Um, so in the in the meantime, um, yeah. So decide, decisive defeat. I, I can. I actually want to start with what Beth said. Um, yeah. So we're talking about decisive defeats. We also should be conscious that you know something does not have to be a decisive defeat of reaction to be a defeat of reaction, um, and that there are immediate things that we need to do, like taking back the house, um, which would be a huge uh, step forward. Um, so one person, one vote, absolutely. Any way that um, that we can make that happen. So ending, um, finding a way to to end the, uh, the gerrymandering of districts, um, combating voter suppression, um, making sure that the voice of somebody from California counts equally in the Senate as to the voice of somebody from Wyoming. Um, uh, these are these are big things. These, these would be huge, huge defeats for the anti-democratic forces in our society. Local control of police, absolutely. I would add maybe dismantling the um, for-profit uh, prison system and, and totally, in fact, reworking the criminal justice system. Um, uh, rem remember that rewriting part of the Constitution, adding the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the Reconstruction Amendments, was part of a decisive defeat that we won against reactionary forces. So there, there are big things uh, that could be done. Um, and it can include um, democratizing the economy as well. So uh, a an amendment guaranteeing um, universal health care and education to everyone, that would be um, a huge defeat. Uh, and it, it, it is something that with the right amount of strength could be won. 
Um, any more comments before I move on? There are other hands. Um, okay. There are also a lot of comments in the yeah. question. The reason question. Oh, I, just, I didn't scroll down. Okay. Well. Um, uh, so uh, Henry said an important element of a decisive defeat of the right would be the complete discrediting of the extreme right that now controls the Republican Party. Um, right. So a, a kind of cultural shift um, that or a shift in opinions. Um, uh, Bob brought up the fight for, um, oh, ex Restore and Extend Voting Rights Act, overruled Janus, pass an Equal Rights Amendment, Blue Wave Victory, turn back Citizens United, stop the KKK. Um, uh, where would, and where would self-determination fall? Um, uh, self-determination uh, for, um, for national uh national minorities um so one thing we could think of in terms of that is uh protections strong protections for the sovereignty and and, and rights of indigenous people um which uh, are not are, are currently under under attack by the trump regime and have been under kind of systemic attack for a long time um uh so does uh Alexander asks, uh, does, doesn't a decisive defeat require a structural change in the system rather than a transfer of power from different capitalist parties? Um, so do, I would say yes and no. A decisive defeat does change the system, um, uh, but it does not necessarily uh, move beyond capitalism, though it would certainly challenge the power of the far right, which is the most aggressive and most reactionary section of the capitalist class. So something like um, uh, eliminating the Electoral College, changing the Senate, modifying how the Supreme Court works, those would radically diminish the power of the most reactionary part of the capitalist class. Um, uh, Robert brings up uh, global warming, uh, radical changes to society that scientists are saying are necessary to ward off its most dangerous effects. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, a, um, uh, a set of environmental protections based on limiting uh, the right of corporations to pollute rather than on demanding that people give things up. That would be... Um, a decisive defeat for the climate deniers, for, um, and in fact, for, for a huge section of the capitalist class. Um, uh, oh yeah, um, uh, Kaya said, get rid of the electoral college, which someone else also said, absolutely. Um, there's no, there is no need for it anymore. Um, uh, and there are a couple of other questions that I think I'm going to get to later that deal more with the, the big picture about um, democratic struggle and socialist struggle. Uh, but I think I'm gonna move on um, uh, now to our next couple of points. We're doing pretty well on time, so there will be time later. Uh, um, basic idea number three, if we want a decisive defeat of reaction, the working class must lead the fight. Um, not everyone who opposes Trump wants a decisive defeat. Some want to keep the GOP legislative majorities and just get rid of Trump. Others just want to get a Democratic majority in the legislature. Um, how far we go depends on who's leading the fight. The working class, um, the Democratic elements of the capitalist class, so the, the bourgeois, the forces of bourgeois democracy, the most reactionary anti-democratic section of the capitalist class, so Trump and the, the Koch brothers and the sort of GOP core. And when I talk about reactionary force, I just want to get this out there. When I talk about reactionary forces and the need to break their power, um, I am not talking about like we must like disenfranchise Trump voters and, and strip them of their, you know, democratic rights. And they must not 
No, this, the, the reactionary forces in our society are in the, in the first place, um, this, these, this reactionary section of the capitalist class. So the Waltons, the Cokes, the, the fossil fuel industry, um, a lot of the real estate industry, um, the, the billionaires that align themselves with the core kind of agenda of the GOP, that's, those are the reactionary forces. So um, I, I wanted to make that clear because I have the impression that people a lot of the time talk about uh, Trump voters and especially working class people who voted for Trump as somehow this you know, menace, this threat that has to be uh, eliminated. Uh, so that aside, uh, why does the working class have to lead? And remember, the working class is multiracial, multinational, men and women, um, LGBTQ people, um, indigenous people, like this is uh, a much bigger picture. Why, the work, why working class leadership? Because working class people don't have anything to gain from capitalism or even from any of the kinds of inequality that capitalism uses to maintain its power. White supremacy, patriarchy, um, heteronormativity and, and homophobia and transphobia, those do not benefit working class people. We need working class leadership also because the capitalist class is inconsistent in the fight for democracy. Um, they have to maintain their power over workers. They won't go all the way to getting rid of inequality. Um, even if they, you know, they may support some aspects of democratic struggle, not all of it, only the working class can go all the way. And also practically, working class people have a better understanding of collective work and solidarity. Um, it's just, it's, a, it's built into how working class people work, how they live, um, and, and, and that is, that's part of the picture too. Um, so if we want to the working class has to lead, leadership doesn't mean just economic issues. And that's a mistake that, that we see all over the place, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, we need a program that really just talks about wages, uh, whatever. No, that's not working class leadership. It also doesn't mean making fun of liberals and saying, oh, you know, yeah, we're, they're so backward. We're way more radical than them. That's not working class leadership. And working class leadership also doesn't mean thinking that because we're Marxists, uh, we're automatically qualified to exercise leadership over this movement. Um, and I just wanted to sort of point that out because I think sometimes we have very skewed ideas about what working class leadership actually looks like. And we're going to develop this a little more in the next basic idea. Um, so basic idea number four, political independence or political irrelevance. And this was something that we saw on the two sides, the two different tactics. One side said, we need to be politically independent. We need to not dissolve ourselves into the bourgeoisie. Lenin says that's being politically irrelevant, right? Political independence is our ability to orient the struggle, to set the agenda. It's a question of organization and mobilization. And we can only win that independence, that ability to guide the struggle by being involved in the major political struggles of our time. Um, and there were a couple of quotes from Lenin here. I'm not going to, um, you know, uh, I'm not gonna read them word for word, uh, but basically Lenin says, the working class is politically independent. It's safe from the inconsistency of bourgeois Democrats um, when we have a decisive defeat of the of reactionary forces, when the working class leads that, right? Um, and the role of a working class party is to raise the level of other forces in the struggle, not to demand leadership, not to make them, you know, to say that we, uh, that our 
radical demands give us that right, but to raise the, the level of other forces in struggle. Um, that's what being politically independent for the working class actually means. Um, just to wrap up, and then we can move to some discussion. Uh, a few final thoughts. Liberals are not the main enemy, especially working class people who identify as liberals. Um, so making fun of them uh, and acting like they're somehow holding back the struggle is not going to help. Uh, political leadership comes from getting involved, mobilizing, organizing. It's a question of the actual strength of our class, not how radical our ideas are. You know, we need revolutionary theory. We need Marxist science. We need um, a radical forward thinking agenda, but that is not what's going to determine that the the list of demands is not what determines whether we are in leadership or not. The democratic section of the capitalist class will tend to compromise with reactionary forces until we're strong enough to make them compromise with us. When we're stronger, like we decide what deals get cut. That, and that's, I think, an important point to remember. Um, Lenin uses the phrase working class imprint, putting a working class or proletarian imprint on the democratic revolution. I've said this before, um, that can only be done within the main struggle of the period, which is the fight against Trump and the um, ultra reactionary uh, Republican party or the, 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 the core of that party. Um, and so it, it doesn't, it, it, there's no use sitting on the sidelines and demanding a different struggle saying we should actually be struggling for this. We should actually be struggling for that. This is the struggle that's happening. This is where we need to be. And anything that takes away from our involvement in that struggle is a, is a way of conceding power to other forces. Um, uh, um, and I, I do want to respond to one um, uh, Craig asked a question, um, so pointing out the the law, the democratic revolution is ongoing in this country, beginning with the American Revolution all the way through the Civil War, the suffrage movement, civil rights, LGBTQ rights, the Green Movement, the Peace Movement. Um, uh, how do we as communists recognize which struggles to lend our efforts to? I see popular resistance around, against Trump, massive support among certain sections of the working class for non-establishment candidates. When is working for establishment Democrats actually aiding and abetting the right wing? Should we throw our lot in with insurgent candidates within the Democratic Party or come together to support the Pelosi's and Clintons of the world? What to do? Um, and I just wanted to I wish I could, I wish I had noted down the exact passage from Lenin. It reminded, this question reminded me of, I think it's in chapter 11 of Two Tactics. Lenin discusses the issue of a litmus test. Is there a way of deciding, you know, who, which, um, you know, who's a sincere friend of the working class, who's really our ally and who's not? And what he says is, no, there's no, there's no litmus test. There's no set of demands where, you know, if you don't meet these, you're against us. And if you do, you're, you're our ally. Um, because the, the, the Pelosi's and the Clintons, uh, the Bloomberg's, the, um, whoever else you want to name, um, they, they are inconsistent, right? They will swing to our side when, when our power is greater. And we actually, we saw this in the, at the outcome of the Democratic primaries in 2016. That Democratic program was markedly different from previous ones. Um, not perfect, not, you know, a advanced social democratic program, but much more favorable to the working class than they've been before. Um, so, uh, in answer to your question, um, sometimes insurgent candidates, uh, sometimes Pelosi's and Clinton's, like the main task is breaking the power of the far right. Um, 
breaking the power of the democratic section of the bourgeoisie is not is not the main point on the agenda. I hope that that was some sort of an answer anyway. Um, uh, let's see, building a cooperative sector in the economy uh, from Dante O'Hara. Um, uh, that could be hmm, could be part of the democratization of the of the economy. Uh, certainly, a way of building workers' power still within a market context. Um, oh, question from Jay: To what extent does the working class understand the choices between these two tactics? Is there time left to educate them? How is that done? Um, that's a terrific question. Uh, I think, you know, there, there's this idea a lot of us fall into sometimes that working class people are, you know, not fully politically conscious. They don't recognize their actual interests. They they don't know how to struggle politically for things. I, 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 I'm not sure that's entirely true. Um, I think there's a, from what I've seen anyway, being involved in electoral work in my, my little town in upstate New York, um, it's working class people who have been doing this, organizing themselves to canvas and get out the vote and everything, um, you know, for, for a long time. So I think there is a broad understanding of this in a lot of the working class. Um, and we, we can help build that organization, contribute to sort of a longer perspective of, of the goals we could fight for. But um, I think a lot of that educational base is, is already there maybe. Um, do, you so want to open, the, do you want to open the floor now? Yes, let's open, open the floor. Okay, if you have a question or a comment, please use your raised hand icon. And I'm scrolling through and I will um, open your mic. Just a moment, please. Just click your, the hand and it will indicate that you want to speak. Um, is it Gersey? Last name Gersey. You need to click your mic and you can speak. Just there you are. Could you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I think it is worth mentioning uh, that um, uh, in the uh, uh, International Workingmen's Association, time of Marx, there was a split of whether to support the union or not. Uh, and the, the Marxist faction won. Uh, and Marx uh, sent a telegram of congratulations to uh, Abraham Lincoln upon his uh, second uh, election uh, victory. And I read the uh, telegram and it was, uh, uh, he didn't mince his words. Uh, uh, whereas the anarchists, uh, with the notable exception of Bakunin, uh, 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 decided to take a neutral stand uh, in the civil war, uh, and I thought this was uh, uh, very. This is very relevant to the topic we are uh, discussing. Thank you. Okay, if you'd like to make a comment or um, introduce a question, please just click the hand. I'm scrolling through to see. I'm going to uh, jump in with another one from the list of written questions. Um, this is from uh, Quia, uh, sort of uh, transmitted by Margaret Baldridge. Um, uh, two, tactics, two Tactics is based on the rising consciousness of the proletariat, peasantry, and radical intellectuals. 
Uh, no amount of pamphlets or preaching can enlighten the proletariat if it's enlightened on its own by the dark forces of capitalism. How can our struggle deepen working class consciousness uh, in the United States? Um, and I'm, I'm going to sort of leave that out there for uh, right now for people to sort of chew on as they um, uh, think about their uh, other questions and comments. Steve, your mic is open. Uh, yeah, thanks. That was a good presentation. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, there are two very, very basic things that I think uh, have to be main struggles and coming up uh, for our electoral victory. One is to take money out of politics so that it becomes more of a one person, one vote situation where the Koch, two Koch brothers have several million times the power that I have because of their wealth. Uh, and the other thing that we have to fight for is uh, public funding of campaigns. We have that to a certain extent in Maine, but it's very, very incomplete. And it makes a big difference as to who can run for office. And that you can get off the ground <clears throat> with a relatively small amount of money. And I think that's a big victory for the working class in that it enables working class people to run, particularly for local office, uh, when that can happen. Um, I think also that um, one of the things that has to happen is the people have to be educated in terms of what are the economic and working class benefits of winning an election. In other words, the average worker has to understand, I'm going to go out, do all this work to get so-and-so elected. What am I going to get out of it? And I think this is something that is up to us to educate the people to do. Thank you. And 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 that that goes to, in a certain sense, the um, not so much the question of raising class consciousness, but of our role in in taking. I mean, class consciousness and democratic consciousness are rising in our society. Um, one of our one of the things we need to work on is translating that into effective political action. Um, uh, and um, Kaya Davidson asked a question, do we have a working class party? Um, so the, uh, the Communist Party is a party of the working class. Um, do we have a, a mass working class party um, that, you know, uh, is represented in, um, in the legislature or anything like that? Not yet. Um, but there are definitely working class forces within um, within the Democratic Party, um, and again, our party is is a a party of the working class. Um, so this I, uh, that sort of brings us to an hour. Um, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. I, I apologize um, uh, for if I didn't get a chance to take your question or if. Um, you were unable to get through with your question. Um, hopefully, discussions like these will continue.